Well, thank you uh, for coming, and it is my understanding that uh, nobody gets the drinks until I'm done. <laughs> so, with great power comes great responsibility, and I will try to keep it short. What I want to talk about, you could say it, the aspects of domain-driven design that make me feel dissatisfied, or perhaps should be making us feel dissatisfied more than we are. So I want to talk about this from a sort of skeptical perspective, but also an optimistic one, because um, there's a lot of reason to think that we're onto something. 15 years is quite a long time. And uh, it's certainly longer than I would have expected this thing to run. Uh, that is to say, 15 years ago, almost exactly, about 15 years and one month ago, my book came out. And, uh, and by the way, read it if you haven't. <laughs> and especially buy it if you haven't. <laughs> now, uh, it, it hasn't stood still all that time, right? The DDD as we talk about it today isn't exactly the way we talked about it 15 years ago. I mean, and I am grateful for that, because I couldn't have stood it. I would have been too bored, and I would have left long ago. And many people have been active in the community of DDD and have introduced innovations that have kept the thing going. Uh, but there's a lot left. So let me just briefly talk about what DDD is. And by the way, there's some kind of a, I hear my voice coming at me. It makes me keep talking quieter and quieter until I don't hear it, but I'd, could we? Well, anyway, so what do we mean when we say domain-driven design? This has been a problem for 15 years or more. I mean, people press me to define domain-driven design better. And for a long time, I thought, you know, that probably would help. But I'm not completely sure about that. How tightly should a concept like domain-driven design be defined? I mean, different kinds of concepts have definitions sort of at different levels. And you could imagine a kind of scale of rigorousness. And I think that you could imagine that we want to hit a sort of medium where our definition isn't too strict. Like, one of the tendencies is that people who want a more strict definition start moving in the direction of a kind of cookbook where everything is very programmed, a kind of step-by-step, -step, this is how you do DDD, this is exactly what every element of DDD would be like. And, uh, on the other hand, you get too broad of a definition, and it's just the kind of hand-wavy good thing, you know. You could go even broader. It could just become a kind of, you could get so refined that it, it would be really cool and uh, sophisticated that only a handful of people in the world can understand it. Or you could go the other way and just, you know, kind of make us all feel good. I don't, I think there is a sweet spot for a thing like domain-driven design, not least because we need some room to move. Different people need to be able to operate in that space and have different views and innovate. And so when something's so rigorously defined that the slightest change means that it's not DDD anymore, then you can't really progress except away from it. So on the other hand, there are things within domain-driven design that might be more tightly defined than DDD itself. If DDD has an ideal definition that's sort of in a somewhat loose but not too loose kind of space, then maybe ubiquitous language is a little more tightly defined. It's still a bit loose. It's not the tightest kind of narrow definition. Maybe bounded context is a bit more specifically defined than that. You know, on the other hand, maybe core domain is even more loosely defined than domain-driven design itself. And that's weird to think that 
a thing could have a component that's less defined than itself. But then thinking like that would only work in a very rigorously defined world, wouldn't it? I mean, <laughs> in a loosely defined thing, you could have an element inside that was bigger than the thing. <laughs> and we do. <laughs> and then you have really tightly defined things. If you go far enough in my book, you'll find closure of operation. That I pulled straight out of mathematics, and it's as tightly defined as people can make a thing. So there's this range, a spectrum. And if I still haven't convinced you that there should be a spectrum, that it's somehow desirable to define things as tightly as possible, what about happiness, let's say? I mean, I could define happiness very rigorously. I could get into brain chemistry or some subjective experience, and we could say happiness involves certain... But most of the definitions we'd come up with, I think people could latch on to and say, well, then in order to ap uh, optimize happiness, we can invent a drug for that. We already have some fairly good ones. We could make better ones. <laughs> you know, that's the brave new world version of happiness, and it comes from being too tightly defined, right? Happiness is a very ill-defined concept, and it needs to be that way. So... DDD is somewhere between happiness and closure of operations <laughs> in terms of how tightly defined it is. And here's how I've defined it for several years, and I think it works all right. It is a kind of set of guiding principles. It's a philosophy of design and a set of guiding principles. And the primary principles are focus on the core domain, Explore models in a creative collaboration between software experts and domain experts. And speak a ubiquitous language within an explicitly bounded context. I think that definition is kind of in that sweet spot. I'm not saying it's the perfect definition for domain-driven design, but it's a workable one. It gives people a lot of room. But I'm hoping not too much. So, so in order to talk about this, we need to sort of agree what domain-driven design is. Because what I'm saying is that domain-driven design needs to change a bit, and yet still be domain-driven design, probably. Although we'll see. Because one of the things we have to think about is, what if we're wrong? Right? What if the basic assumptions that lead us to do domain-driven design are wrong. Or less uh, dramatically, perhaps some of the techniques we use to do it aren't very good. That's easier to fix. But either one, we have to be open to that. Domain-driven design is a way of developing software. It's a kind of applied philosophy. It is not a religion. There is nothing about it that we shouldn't question and, and look for results. And so, over the last 15 years, I've looked for results. And I've seen results. You know, I've seen projects where we did these things and had wonderful results, but I've also seen an awful lot of attempts that did not lead to what I would have hoped for. And so, I think we really have to think, what is it that isn't right? Or what is it that could be better, at any rate, if you insist on positive framing? But I don't insist on that. So why would we have disappointing results? There's a range of possibilities in any particular case. You know, sometimes I'm in a place where we get disappointing results, and on reflection, I think, it was probably destined to be because the place we were in just didn't have the kind of organization, the kind of culture that made this sort of thing possible. But even this would be something we should worry about if it happens so often that you start to say the conditions in which domain-driven design can really work are so rare that it's almost irrelevant. Well, I don't think that's the case. I think, though, that we could be better at understanding what the circumstances are 
What do you need? What conditions make fertile ground for domain-driven design? This is one of many areas that I think we could explore. And I hope people will. I say I hope people will because this is one where I think I've kind of done all I can. That is, I've thought about this and I've written about it and I, I don't think I'm going to have any interesting insights about this in the future and yet I still don't think what I've said is sufficient. This would be a great thing for someone to really dig into and it would be even better if it were done in some kind of somewhat scientific way, like maybe using some kind of data about real projects. Now, I'm not saying that is really possible, um, but even moving in that direction would be great. Now, poor skills is one thing I see, and this is something we could probably do something about. You know, when I'm on a project and the results are disappointing, and I think, I think it was because the people on the team didn't have the skills that we really needed to pull this off. That they had the right kind of minds and the in you know, the environment and culture was okay, but we just needed better skills. Better skills is something people actually do have ways of improving, you know? And, and, but maybe that's an emphasis that we need to really push. And I have a few other thoughts on that that I'll come back to a little later. Of course, you can always just wave your hands and say, well, you just didn't do it right. That, though, I, I really try to avoid that because I think it's the exit through which you get to, um, you get off too easy. You know, when a technique like domain-driven design doesn't produce the results that you were hoping for, and then you say, well, it's because they didn't do it right. Well, then, okay. Bad luck. Whenever we're trying to analyze things, I do think you can get too hung up on trying to understand the cause of everything, when sometimes there isn't any real cause. I mean, it, you know, I suppose everything has some kind of cause, but no cause that really means anything. It's just the result of bad luck, you know, of a, of a complex situation that just didn't go your way. And I think that actually accounts for quite a bit. Obviously, we don't want a process that depends on exceptional good luck, but I do think it's important when you're trying to understand things not to get all hung up on that. Mysterious unknown causes is kind of a related one. I do think there have been a few times that it failed and I just couldn't see why. I just looked around me and I thought, that should have worked. And I still, to this day, don't really understand why it didn't work. There's not much I can do about this. Uh, but now let's get into, suppose that some of the things we want to do in domain-driven design, but the techniques we use to do them are kind of weak. That can be addressed without really um, changing the fundamental principles of domain-driven design so much as just having better techniques for implementing them. And we've seen that happen within our community a few times. One of the hot topics right now still, and, and it's very active discussion, I think, at this conference, is event storming. To me, um, one of the fundamental principles that I just had up on the screen is that you have this creative collaboration between business experts and um, software experts. That is a very hard thing to pull off. My book doesn't really tell you exactly how to do it, and we all have our techniques for doing them, and they're pretty weak techniques overall, I'd say. And I'd say one of the places event storming fits in is it gives us a technique to attack that that I think is a, is a powerful technique. Not the only thing you need. It doesn't land the plane all by itself, but it helps get that creative collaboration going, and I think it's an example of what I mean here. And then we have to be open to the idea that some of the basic principles are flawed. But even there, there might be ways to flex them a bit and keep the essence of domain-driven design without, uh, you know, just abandoning the ship. So we should 
look at that possibility not just as, okay, well, you know, it's not a religion, but also as, can we adjust them? So there are the, these are the sorts of things I'm talking about. Now, DDD has changed quite a bit, I mentioned, in 15 years. For example, event sourcing was one of the first really big changes. That was a change to the way that we built the software, the actual sort of you know, um, design and implementation. Also a different philosophy of modeling, everything very oriented around the events and the time sequences and so on. And it really freshened things up. It also, I think, improved results. That is, more projects succeeded using event sourcing than when they used, say, very mutation-oriented designs. I think this is true. Not that they succeeded by every measure. They succeeded by the measure I have, which is these sort of getting uh, really important business capabilities, um, you know, things like the kind of things that make a domain-driven design result different than just let's get a bunch of COBOL programmers in here and get the job done 70s style, or just, you know, have an army full of hackers work away, sort of, well, every time style. CQRS, CQRS came along about the same time as event sourcing, and it also had an impact. I think the most significant aspect of this one was it started to get through people's heads that there could be more than one database in a system, more than one place you stored data. This was such an entrenched idea, this one central database, and it's still a common thing, but it was so entrenched that I just think it was really an obstacle to accomplishing good design, and not just domain-driven design, all sorts of good design was being held back by that. CQRS in our community was one of the things that I think helped to loosen that up a bit. Then books started to show up and blogs and other writings so that we started to get more kinds of perspectives, different ways of explaining the things. So one thing is that you might have a perfectly good principle or a perfectly good technique that people just don't understand and then they don't do it right. <laughs> so, of course, at the same time, you introduce the risk that people will explain it in a way that isn't really consistent. So then you have these confusing alternatives. And that, I think, is inevitable. It is so inevitable that I just accept that it's going to happen. We should try to minimize it in certain ways and maybe even encourage it in others. The ways in which I think we should minimize it would be that the basic definitions of terms we ought to try to hold to. Bounded context, I think, is quite an important concept. I would like the definition of bounded context to be consistent. And it's not entirely. Some of the people who are quite prominent aren't completely consistent about that term and how it, they use it versus me. On the other hand, someone might say, I think we should chop a system up into very fine pieces. And another person might say, I think we need bulkier pieces. That's the sort of thing where I think disagreement is healthy. Or, uh, you know, that's just an example, but there's a lot of kinds of issues where I think we shouldn't have a uniformity of opinion. Having some nice, clear definitions that people agree on helps to have interesting conversations about the differences of opinion, because you can say, I think that we should use, you know, this, bounded context in this way, and someone else says, yes, I think we should use bounded context, and they don't mean the same thing. We're actually expressing a different opinion. We'll see, that's useless. I mentioned event storming already, but it has been a livener, and there have been a few other things like that, but only a few, but good ones. Um, I think another shift has been, at least in my practice of domain-driven design, a big shift in the direction of doing a lot of experiments. I've talked about this quite a bit. The majority of the code, I think this is, it's always been true of me that the majority of code written is throwaway code. 
Certainly the vast majority of code that I have written has been throwaway code. And the majority of code written by other people on teams that I am leading is throwaway code. But this isn't always the case um, on projects doing domain-driven design. And I think uh, that, but I think it's, you know, that the idea of running lots of experiments should be one of those ideas that we start to push. Production code is incredibly expensive, and you don't want to do your experiments that way. Right? That's one of the things about typical agile pra practice is that it's always moving forward and always building production code. And yet, if you, and they say, well, you can change direction every two weeks or every time you have the, but you can only change direction in the sense that, well, I've gone forward this far, now I can go this way, and now I can go this way. You can't say, well, this, let's say, let's just try these four directions, and then we'll decide which one we like when we throw all four of them away and have chosen the one we like. I think that, if I were going to talk about a change in my own practice that isn't one of these things, I think that would be the biggest. But one thing that is different from 15 years ago is that there's a DDD community now. Things like this conference did not happen 15 years ago. There were a lot of people interested in domain-driven design right from the start, partly because you know, there were drafts of the book circulating and stuff. But the possibilities created by a group of people like we have now, I think, are, are very significant. When you want to shake up something like domain-driven design, one person can only do that a little bit, you know, or a small cadre of people. It takes really a bigger group, I think. And there are lots of things we could try. I'll talk about a few. So, one is this core domain thing. I think it's quite important, but I have to admit that it's not very well defined. I mean, it's in that category I don't think should be all that well defined, but I'll also say that the techniques that I've laid out for doing it are a bit weak. So if you actually do manage to drill down and identify the core domain, well, and you did something really good, but it wasn't like you followed some process or anything, I don't think. You just have a good intuition for it. I've pulled it off a number of times, but I've done it by just sort of intuition and luck. Um, and there are other fields, you know, like I've known a few management consultants who talk about how they go into organizations and they try to help the organization figure out what its goals are and focus and plan reorganizations and stuff. And I'm thinking, wow, those tools sound like they ought to be related to distilling the core domain. I don't know. But I'm not going to be the person who figures that out. I don't know enough about those things. I'm probably not quite interested enough in those things. I hate to admit it, but it's true. And so, but there are other people in this community, you know, that do have different backgrounds than I have, different knowledge than I have, or different interests, so they can go out and get the background and knowledge. And some of those people might say, it's true that in other, in people who really focus on management techniques uh, have, tech, have approaches to this, and we should draw upon them. We should just, you know, steal like mad. Also on the subject of focusing on the core domain, so one of the things that I kind of advocate in the book, and I've largely advocated elsewhere, is that you try to identify that, and then you just go for the throat. And I still think that in a lot of situations, this is the thing to do. That we pussyfoot around too much, you know, building these elegant architectures in this little capstone of, of really valuable business capability sits on top of this huge pyramid of generic, software and, and uh, technology. And I do think that usually the thing to do is if you know what that core domain is, if you know what they need, 
then try to build that thing and don't let anything else get in the way. Don't say, well, we'll build that thing after we rebuild you know, this legacy system so that it will sit on top of a neat thing. Find a way to go right for it. And I've made a number of presentations about that and even wrote a paper about that that you can get online. Strategies for, you know, um, going straight for the core domain. And yet, there are a lot of situations where you just don't quite know what the core domain is or you can't see a way to tease it apart. And there's another possibility, I think, and it would be, what if you started trying to carve away as much else as you could? Now, generic subdomains, for example, when you, uh, you know, I made a presentation last year at this conference and also at DDD Europe about the possibilities of exploring generic subdomains more, modeling them more, building more libraries. And why do I think that might be valuable? There's a number of reasons, but one of them is because when you have this whole tangle of important business logic, some of it's core, some of it's generic, and if you really had clear, elegant models of the generic part, it would be easier to sift that part out and express the rest in terms of that. And then what's left, well, it's, still, it's not like that's going to just leave your core domain sitting there. Um, but it will be uh, you know, less diffused, more clear. And if you could just do that, just keep carving away, that might make a difference. You know, that's sort of this old thing about if you are a sculptor and you just take away all the rock that isn't whatever it's supposed to be. It's not quite like that, but it's a nice quote anyway. <laughs> so generic subdomains, there's something we could get better at. And I do think that it could help with this core domain issue. It's not any kind of guarantee of that but it does potentially uh, remove distractions and help us to sharpen the expression because a lot of times you'll say, you'll express some concept in terms of other concepts, right? In terms of lower level or more generic concepts. What makes our business so special is that the way we handle these broadly defined generic things, but we handle them in a different way. Well, another thing about it though, I was talking earlier about skills, right? Like, we do have, I think, a bit of a skills problem. And one of the things that I remember when I was learning, uh, the first really exciting stuff I did was in Smalltalk. I was so excited about Smalltalk in the very late 90s, early, I mean, the very late 80s and, very, and early 90s. And, but one of the traditions of Smalltalk was that there were all these libraries and they were nicely written, and you would learn good small talk style by looking at existing code and seeing how they did it and using it, getting a feeling of what it's like to build on top of nice code. And so I think that we could get more of that if people built more really nice generic libraries. Um, I talked last year, you know, about um, that, so I won't go into it too deeply. I think another thing is that it gives you a chance, though, to practice. If you're, if, so, on the one level, you can learn by looking at other people's generic uh, libraries and seeing how nicely they did it, seeing what they did. But in, on another level, you can practice by trying to do it yourself. And we as a community can even figure out, like, well, what is it that works, what makes nice code nice? By putting out there, well, here's an example. I think this is nice. Someone else says, well, I don't, I'm not that wild about that, but here's a way that I like it, right? And we could start to not just talk to each other about <clears throat> what makes a nice design, though well, that's a good thing to do, but also show each other. make nice things and show them to each other and 
get this kind of dynamic interaction going. And practice. How much practice you have to do to be good at something. And if you want to be really good at, at uh, design and modeling, then you have to practice a lot. And it can't always be, you know, good athletes don't just practice by going to tournaments and uh, you get better by going to lots of tournaments. They practice by, you know, doing the sport that in a non-tournament setting, right? We need to do our sport in a non-tournament setting. And by the way, maybe we should sometimes think of it as a bit like a sport, because clearly we care about it in ways that aren't purely practical, right? <clears throat> now, I do think we could go too far down this path and forget that not all of a large software system will be well designed. So our goal shouldn't be to make every generic subdomain, everything beautiful. Um, also, by the way, we shouldn't try to force a single model onto a subdomain. I mean, uh, last year, I presented a particular a set of models that I had come up with for time. I didn't present one because in my practicing using this time generic subdomain, I came up with quite a range of different models. And I think there are lots more where that came from. But there are also lots more generic subdomains, and it would be nice to branch out a bit. But the thing is that, that making everything beautiful isn't necessarily our goal. We should still remember that what we care about most is that core domain. So somehow or other, even if it's cleaving a lot of generic things away from it, we're hoping to bring that core domain into relief. Then maybe we bring in some of those management techniques and look at it again and say, yeah, that's the part that we want. And then we go for the throat. And then we build a little bubble context to make that in, or, or something like that. I don't know. I don't want to say exactly how it would be, because my whole point here is we should be trying a lot of different things. Well, moving on. I talked about generic subdomains as an example where maybe we could you know, try something new, not exactly what we've been talking about for all these years, but really uh, freshen things up. One of the things, though, that, you know, as I said, I'm dissatisfied with is the bounded context is a concept that I feel like hasn't ever fully reached its potential. And uh, part of that must be that I haven't explained it very well. So I've tried it a few different ways, and some other people have tried it a few different ways. Some of those ways, I'm afraid, might not have been quite in alignment with the concept either. So, so this is something that I really think needs to be better, because I think that bounded context is such a fundamental principle of domain-driven design that if we... Um, if we can't get that one a bit more sorted, I don't think we'll make a whole lot of progress from where we are. That's my opinion. Um, so I have thought about that. I mean, I wrote a paper about the bubble context and legacy assets. I think that the microservice people have gone crazy with bounded context in some good ways, and probably in some not so good ways. I do think that there are things we could do. I mean, like, even the techniques of, of bounded context and context mapping, perhaps we could go at this again. I've talked some with some people around, like Matthias and I have talked about that a lot. Like, could we have different, really recognize there are different kinds of contexts? We talk sometimes about how some contexts are a big ball of mud, but the ones that aren't a big ball of mud, I bet there's not just one kind when I think about it. There are some, for example, where I'm trying to focus on the core domain. There are some where I want to make a generic library package. These might be really fundamentally different sorts of... They, they share that characteristic. They have that boundary, and inside they have a clear model 
well, not a, ba not a big ball of mud. Inside, they have a model that we're hoping won't just spread everywhere. Maybe we even have contexts that we label as like, this is a context for a crazy rush. We know we're going to just break a lot of things in here, so let's label it. And don't expect, then you know what to expect, right? That you expect that this is not one you're going to want to involve for a long time. Or you might have something you could call a house of cards context. Yes, it, it's good, except it's very, very fragile. I don't know. I'm just saying that I think we, could, we need to go further in this. And what I'm trying to get across is that my book is not the beginning and end of this topic. I am very, very open to the idea that other people are going to come up with new ideas. They have about, you know, I already gave a few examples, and there are some others. This is an area where we need some. <clears throat> One area that we should probably put some serious attention to, and I have been thinking about this quite a bit, but I don't really have any good ideas, is the microservices interest. Let's face it, one of the reasons that there's been a bit of a bump in interest in domain-driven design in the last couple of years or so is because the incredible uh, explosion of microservices has a subset of people in it that, that think that the bounded context in particular and domain-driven design sometimes in general is, a tech, is, a, is something that's useful to them. And I think that's good. I mean, of course that's good. If we want to have any impact, we have to reach things like that. Not only that, but I think that the things that are coming out of microservices, well, there are a lot of good things there. The trouble is that it's so big and exploding so fast that, of course, there's also a lot of terrible stuff coming out of there, including, no doubt, twisting of the concept of bounded context. So, what do you do? I mean, you know, so... There is a sense sometimes in which we just resist something because it's popular and too big and too kind of, it no longer has that slightly sophisticated edge to it. Like, you know, I liked this band before anyone had ever heard of them kind of stuff. And I think that might have happened somewhat with the... Uh, with microservices, you know, no one wants to jump on a bandwagon. Except, of course, that the metaphor, jump on a bandwagon, actually comes from people jumping on, literally jumping onto literal wagons that have literal bands on them. This is a picture of a bandwagon. And I'm thinking, wouldn't you like to jump on that thing? <laughs> I, I don't think it'd keep me off there. And that's the way I feel sometimes when I hear about when some people talk about microservices, right? The way some people describe what they've done with microservices makes me feel excited. Like, yes, there's something here. And then I hear a whole bunch of other people saying a whole bunch of other things, and I get afraid. So we might be able to even contribute a little bit to this issue by s helping the larger software community in this effort to separate the baby from the bathwater. I think microservices has been like a comet strike to the earth, but we kind of <laughs> needed a comet strike. If nothing else, they got rid of shared databases. They have the idea that teams can actually control parts of a design and that the, the, it's nobody's business, kind of. I don't know, they've done a lot of good things, and they're, they have a lot to answer for, too. But then probably we do, too. And so I think giving some serious thought to this, and especially to the question probably of bounded context, because it's been dumbed down a little bit, like, oh, a microservice would be the boundary of a bounded context, and then another microservice would be another bounded context, See, that's how you take something further to the right of that definition spectrum over to the c trivial cookbook version of microservices and bounded context. 
We need to pull it back to the deeper thinking. How can we take the best of microservices and, the, and a, better def, a better understanding of bounded contexts and, you know, do better things, have more, have nicer outcomes? By the way, I don't know, one of the things, okay, well, I was about to change subjects. Microservices, but let's say one thing is that <clears throat> I don't think that we would have a new conference in Denver and a new conference in Berlin and so on and so on about domain-driven design. Whole fresh crop of thousands of people reading the old book and thinking about what it might, what potential it might have, that just wouldn't be happening without the microservices thing. So let's not uh, ignore the upside. Well, here's another thing I think we should seriously think about, and that is take a fresh approach to legacy systems. You know, um, one of the areas. You know, I've talked about this, and I've become more and more and more this way. When I wrote the book, though, I'll have to admit that there was a pretty heavy bias to saying still a bit of, yeah, it would be nice to get rid of those legacy systems. And uh, I thought, well, you know, we could do it in a phased way, and I even described kind of a phased approach. And phased approach would be a big improvement over what people do when they try to do a big bang. But for some time, I've thought, no, th there's no reason that we should set that as our goal. Um, you know, that the existence of the legacy system is not usually the issue. Now, going beyond that, I've started to think, furthermore, we should just change the whole way of thinking. I mean, what is a legacy system? How would you even define that? Is it just as some people have joked, it's just any software that actually works. <laughs> well, you know, that's a common definition that people throw out, and I think, yeah, you know, there's something to that. There is a kind of maturity that, you know, systems go through a kind of life cycle, I think, and there's this exciting, fresh, new kind of software where anything's possible. And then it goes through a kind of early maturity where it's producing some value, but still things are flexible. And then it starts to get stiff with age for various reasons. And, and I suppose that's when we call it legacy, or maybe when it gets really bad. But I think if we took a, just objectively step back at it, we could really look at this a different way. And it happens that we have someone at the conference this year who is sort of one of the people that's been associated with um, thinking about legacy systems more deeply than most people have. And, you know, techniques for actually dealing with them, changing them, uh, and so on. And he's doing a keynote tomorrow. Unfortunately, his keynote is not about legacy systems. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm sure it'll be very uh, valuable anyway. But we can still pin him down between sessions and make him talk. <laughs> but the thing is that, you know, there's all kinds of software, and I think we just sort of, uh, you know, as I say, sometimes we dumb things down. And this whole just dump it in the category of legacy systems is a this sort of dumb way of linking about software, I think. It's just not very deep. Now, I have lately been trying to shift the metaphor, you know? Uh, so the bounded context idea, been trying to come up with a new metaphor for it. Sometimes when you get a fresh metaphor, it helps you think fresh. So I, I started using this metaphor of a community garden. I had an experience with a community garden. And it's this, it's very, there's a wonderful kind of analogy between a community garden and a large software system with lots of pieces, I think. And I've talked about that in, a, in other talks, so I don't want to go into it in depth. 
the idea of freshening up a, uh, a metaphor. But one aspect of this metaphor is that it does kind of have an interesting little thing that pops out, which is when does a garden become most valuable? When does it produce the most value? Well, that would be late summer, right? At a certain stage of maturity, but long past the stage at which you can easily change it, you can't rearrange a garden at that stage. In the early spring, you could rearrange a garden, but not in the late summer. But a late summer garden is when all the produce comes out of it, you know, when it's really cranking out value. And that's actually, I see that a bit with software. Software at its most malleable phase isn't at its most productive phase necessarily. Now, we might be able to do better, get to productive phase faster by that go for the throat thing that I was talking about earlier. But I just, I'm just getting at this, let's really stop thinking about legacy systems as just this bad thing that we want to somehow get away with, from. Okay, so I seem to have made a little mistake with my slide, and I just have a slide with, with Michael's head in it. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. That's what happens when you finish your slide deck on the day of the presentation. Okay, so moving on. You know, I'm not going to go into so much detail with other thoughts, but often there is a kind of underlying assumption in DDD that the technical tools are good enough to support us in our goals. And uh, that's a implied in my book when I talk about how the best software people constantly get sucked into really technical kinds of work, and we need them to stay focused on, you know, the core domain, or at least on the domain. And sometimes uh, I look back at the early 2000s and I say, I think I'll let us off the hook a little bit. Some of the reasons that our results were disappointing back in those days was that the technology really was fighting against us. I mean, things like, you know, the uh, whole J2EE entity beans nightmare, just to start. And I'm not going to talk about that. I've talked about that on other occasions. You know, everything had to go through an OR mapper, and then it went down into a relational database, and there were just so few options. Things are different now, and much better. But are they good enough still? Well, they are much better. So the range of situations in which they're good enough is bigger. Because obviously, back in 2003, we had successes with the technology of 2003, though not with entity beans, I think. It's safe to say. <laughs> but other technologies available at that time. And the technologies that we have now really open up the possibilities. For example, all the event sourcing stuff is a lot easier to do if you have technology to support it with all the messaging and everything. And that stuff's pretty mature. But I think we've got a ways to go. Just um, recently, I was trying an experiment. I mentioned I do a lot of experiments. And I was trying an experiment where, uh, that in, and I wanted to run some code in a browser, I wanted to run it locally. I didn't think that was going to be such a challenge. Because, so I started, I wanted to get some data through a Google API and then manipulate it a bit, ideally in ClojureScript. This was my initial goal, and so to store my results in, browser, in the browser's own local storage, HTML5 kind of thing. That is a bit harder than it sounds. Or maybe it sounds really hard to you. It didn't sound that hard to me, and I just plunged in. But I realized that, uh, first of all, figuring out how to make the Google APIs work is confusing. You have to, you know, this, for perfectly good reasons, there are security constraints. And you have to get all those credentials lined up with the, um, origin domain and all that stuff. And then when you got that working and you just try not to 
break. And I'm sure there are people here, by the way, who are really good at, at those Google APIs and all those credentials things. And then come talk to me, OK? And then I got into, oh, here was a nice library that someone had written in JavaScript that could uh, do, at a kind of high level, the thing I wanted, where I had been expecting to have to pick through the Google API at a very low level and put together this thing. And then I realized this library does almost exactly what I want. And, but it was written for Node running on the server. And it wouldn't work in a browser. And after some research, I found this thing called a browserizer. And you can run it on that, and it will sort of crunch it into something that can actually be loaded in a browser and run. But it is incredibly tricky. <clears throat> because uh, any kind of external reference that you might have gets lost. And then when I went to, but I got it working. Then I said, OK, now I'm to the real domain logic, and it's time to use ClojureScript. And ClojureScript is supposed to have interop with these things. And oh, man, Closure script does have interop with these things, but you have to understand so much. You have to get, uh, again, it's partly the reference, partly the hyper-optimization that get, kicks in whenever this thing from Google, which is called closure, not closure with a J, but closure with an S. <clears throat> and it is like an almost compiler. And I say an almost compiler because it takes, well, it actually takes JavaScript produces optimized JavaScript. And a compiler could do something like that, but it's an almost compiler because if you're not set up right, so say you have external references that you haven't declared in exactly the right way, it doesn't fail. It just makes them not work. <laughs> and a compiler, I think, wouldn't do that. It would either work <laughs> or it would fail. You know, compilers tend to work or fail, but they don't just kind of quietly ignore you. <laughs> so not that I'm complaining about what they've done. Now, let me be clear. It is a marvelous tool. This whole set, all those things I just talked about are marvelous things that people have created recently. The potential of them is amazing. But when you actually get to trying to put them together, using two or more of them at the same time, it's just overwhelming. I actually finally got this whole thing assembled. And then when I started to, oh, now I'm out of time. I've got to get ready for the conference. I didn't ever have time to do my experiment, because I spent all the time getting the technical setup working. I think it's working. Sometime I'll, I hope to have time to go back to the experiment. But my point here is, why should it be so hard to take these different libraries and put them together? The composability of these libraries should be a, a, a top concern, I think. And I get why it's so hard to do. But I'm just saying, maybe the, the technology stack still has a long way to go. It's so much better than it was 15 years ago. So much better. And I don't want to sound unappreciative to the people who have done that, because I am not. I am so impressed and so happy with the things that have happened in the last 15 years, but we're not there yet. We really aren't. And it could be that one of the issues is that people like us don't have very many deep conversations with people who build technological platforms. I think that's mostly true, and I think that you know, we're two separate worlds, and so some of the things that we understand and that we care about aren't always addressed. And it's really hard to get connected to other communities. But um, I think, and I want to go out on this, this idea that as we try to address these, I've, you know, I've listed off a handful of things, specific things, where I feel like we need to do better where DDD needs to be fixed. But there are others. I'm not saying this is an exhaustive list. Now I'm going to talk a little, though, about I think that part of the secret to moving forward from where we are now is more kind of a more collaborative style. Um, like, you know, DDD experts really getting in there with 
software technology people. And um, I don't know exactly how that would happen. I mean, I have a few friends who are software technology experts, and we still don't always... I mean, you know, we talk about this idea, and we kind of try to say, well, what would it be like? And we haven't made much progress. But I'm just talking about myself there. I think that would be great. So um, also, just DDD experts collaborating with each other. I think there's a lot more potential in that. Uh, we can try experiments and show them to each other. We can get together to try experiments. We can talk about it, of course, as we do at a conference like this. A conference like this shouldn't be just broadcast, right? The term conference suggests that people will talk to each other and exchange ideas and maybe come up with new approaches which they will then pursue after the conference. So also related to this is another, the other keynote that we have tomorrow. I think that uh, she's going to talk about different kinds of collaboration, some that work on the project levels. This would kind of fit into what I was saying earlier about we say that we need domain experts and software experts to collaborate, but that's easier said than done. She's going to talk some about that, I think, but also about how people collaborate. That would be to get a project done, right? But also maybe how people collaborate to be more creative. And uh, so, you know, there are a few things where I uh, think we, you know, where I'm kind of focusing. I mentioned a few bounded context related things. Uh, I mentioned the generic subdomains. Maybe people will have ideas of other generic subdomains that would be fun to attack. And then, um, uh-oh, I'm getting stuck here. Sorry, but I'm going to have to go out of this and try to go back into it. Oh, boy. I think that I am probably, <laughs> yeah, I'll probably have to. So speaking of things that are wonderful tools, but maybe not quite there, is uh, a um, is maybe cloud-based presentation software in <laughs> offline mode. Oh well. So that's all right because I was about to wrap up. And what I was going to say is that all of this has been a bit rambling, right? A little bit about generic subdomains, a little bit about bounded context, and maybe we should collaborate and this and that. But what I'm trying to do is get a sense of the breadth, the range of possibilities here and say we uh, should, you know, I, I encourage the people here to go out and, and attack some of those things and to bring expertise from other fields and to collaborate with other people who are here or collaborate with people that you know out there that are experts in different fields. That's what I'm trying to do, and that's what I hope that, uh, that people will do. And then we can, you know, shake up. You know, DDD's been really shaken up a couple of times over the last 15 years, and I think it's about due for another big shake up. So let's, let's do it. Let's shake up DDD. And uh, on that note, also, let's go have a drink.